Hi everyone, good morning. I hope you all are having a wonderful morning. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being subscribers, those of you that are. And um, those of you that's not, just thank you. I also thank you for choosing to stop by today. As usual, I've said this before, you are welcome to go to my playlist on my channel. You can hit the playlist tab. You'll see a variety of videos that I have organized under certain topics. I have things there for toxic relationships, toxic family members, toxic leadership, church hurt. There's stuff about forgiveness. There's things about being single and saved. Uh, there's just a variety of things. I have a video, uh, also have a playlist called Women guard your curves i think ladies you would really enjoy that especially being a single woman there's a lot of things in there guys so just go and look at that playlist and see what's there and you can just enjoy it and then of course you're always welcome to watch my videos as they are uploaded i'm still in the process or attempting going to organize the videos more maybe adding a little bit adding more videos there because I have since I've done the, that playlist I've obviously created more content so yeah <laughs> so Lord I just thank you for giving me this word thank you and I'm asking you to please help me to bring it correctly let me not add anything that did not come from you Lord so guide me guide my heart touch my heart and guide my mouth in Jesus name amen all right, guys, so I want to talk about the fact that there's going to come a time where God is going to be bringing his judgment. There are things that's going to happen, and it's probably already and is happening in many people's lives because they refuse to allow him to be Lord. There are people that want God at their convenience, their way, and what happens is you can't have God and the world. You can't have God and darkness at the same time. The word of God tells us that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we are of him and partake in darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. So, and that is in, it's either in first, second or third John, okay? Um, but it is there, not John chapter one, two and three, but first, second or third John, it's there. Or you can just Google it and say, God is light. There is no darkness in him. You put in something like that, it'll pop up. And so what is happening is there are lots of people that's trying to, lots of believers that kind of want to settle out of the Bible with the Lord. Okay. They want to see what they can get. They want to settle outside of the laws with God. Well, Lord, look, let's work out this amount. And it is not going to happen. And what really happens, what people don't realize is that the wages of sin brings death. When you sin to whatever capacity, whether it's in thought or in deed or thoughts or things that are more obvious in action, you open up yourself to the powers of darkness. And they're just going to run their course in a sinner's life. Some things I read about or hear about that's happening in the news and I'm horrified by it. And the Lord will begin to just reveal some things, not all the time, but certain things happen to people, certain things happen in their household because there is, they don't regard God or he is, they, be, they are, they believe in him or they believe in the idea of him, but he's not Lord of their lives. So what happens is, Sometimes these people, they don't have a prayer life. They don't communicate with the Lord. They're, especially once they begin to become more successful, they just start to look at themselves. And they may pray, but their, their heart is not with him. They may say a prayer. They may grace their food. They're people that's religious. You know, they're going to grace their food. They're going to grace their food at for Thanksgiving or whatever celebrations, they're going to grace their food at work. They're going to talk about church and God, but they're not with him. And so when that happens, that's going to open people up to the powers of darkness. So sometimes what happens is when darkness hits and things happen and there's a loss, 
and there's chaos and there's mayhem, then people either look up and really start calling out unto God after the fact or they begin to curse God. So there's something that I want to read to you today and I'm going to go from there. It's Jeremiah chapter 7 and I'm going to start at verse 9. And the word of the Lord is, Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? I'm going to read that again. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning at night. 9. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes behold even I have seen it saith the Lord but go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, said the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. So he's saying the same destruction that I brought to Shiloh, I'm going to bring unto you. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up, cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear. There's a time and a window that we have to repent and to turn away from sins and certain things that we may struggle with or go through. Even being a believer, there are things that you may still do, we may still do, and the Lord is going to call us on it. He's going to talk to us about certain things. Now, the more, the closer you get to the Lord, you may not do certain, it, you, you may not be sinning like you used to, but it does not mean that you're, that we're perfect. So there will be things that the Lord may show us that it's going to be more because you may not be doing the going out and doing the mouth, the more obvious things. A lot of things is going to come with a heart and with a mind and even in, with faith and whether you're believing in the Lord, you can be serving the Lord wholeheartedly, but there could be certain mindsets that you have. And one of the things that many, an area in which the Lord is dealing with his people is in the area of love, love for one another. There is a failure in this area of loving and understanding what it is because either people are just too cold and indifferent to one another or, the, or they're being so harsh towards their brothers and sisters in the Lord or... They don't speak up when they need to speak up about sin or things that's wrong. They won't correct them because they think that love means I don't correct. So those three scenarios that are brought up is an area that many will fail and struggle in. And the Lord is saying this, you know, our love for one another, the example that we're setting is what's going to draw people. And as I said before, there are other areas where the Lord will be speaking and speaking and calling out and saying, come back, come back. But the, what's happening is what is worse than the sinner is a believer who comes in with an entitled spirit. They know what the word of God says, but they feel that they can go out, they can steal, they can murder, they can commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods. Whether it's the God of lust, the God of lying, the God of racism, the, the Lord, the God of sexism, the Lord, the uh, the God of prejudice, the God of jealousy, malice, any of those fruits of the spirits. I'm sorry, any of those those works of the flesh that is described that are described in Galatians chapter five, anything that you're walking in that does not please God, because I know there's some people that will say, well, I don't steal and I don't murder and I don't commit adultery. God is only talking about people that stealing and murdering and so I'm good I don't do any of that that is that is one of the biggest thing with sin it makes you prideful and then 
Sin will make you think that you're so slick and smart. Just sinning in general is what the Lord is speaking about. And I'm going to even show you in the New Testament. The audacity to think of many so-called Christians, those who are coming across and saying that professing themselves to be of God, they believe that they can walk in disobedience and do whatever they want to do and then go and stand before the Lord. They worship in Baal and then they think that they can lift up their hands in the presence of God. And a lot of them have this, this mindset that, well, I am a believer. I'm a Christian. God can't do this. God won't do this. I come from this family background. I've been this good. Again, the biggest mistake we can ever make is to com compare ourselves to our old man and say, well, I'm not what I used to be or comparing ourselves to other people and saying, well, I'm not as bad as this person. We have to measure ourselves against the word of God, against Let's measure ourselves against his standard, compare ourselves, and then continue to pray and ask the Lord to bring us to that place. It's impossible for you and I to do that on our own, but it's not impossible for him. The Holy Spirit has been sent to guide us and to lead us into all truth. So therefore, the Lord is saying here in Jeremiah 7, yes, people are thinking, oh, well, it's the Old Testament. It's old. It doesn't matter. It does matter. The word of God, the principles and the character of God and who God is, his requirement for holiness and obedience does not change. And so just as he is making reference to these individuals through Jeremiah and saying to them, do you see what I did to Shiloh where I first set my name, but yet because they were wicked, the abomination I brought onto them, he is saying to them, learn from the people of Shiloh, learn from them. But seeing that you did not hearken and you wouldn't learn, now I'm going to bring onto you the same thing. And so the principle for us is the same. We need to look and learn from, learn the lessons and see what happened to Shiloh. See what happened to these people that he's speaking to. He's telling them, you will get the same thing that they got. Because sometimes what happens is people begin to trust in their positions and they begin to say, well, God is not, God did such and such for our fathers and mothers before us. And I'm from this family and God's not going to do this. Don't be so sure. And there's going to come a time, guys, that no one will be able to pray for such individuals. When God's judgment is getting ready to fall, there's no more, there is no intercession. He's telling Jeremiah here in Jeremiah 7 and 16, therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up or cry nor pray for them because neither make intercession to me for I will not hear. There's come a time where God is not going to hear any prayers and nobody's going to be able to pray anything away from and off of you. Sometimes we have to discern, there are times people are going through things, we all go through things, and we all go through our valley, right, and our storms, and it's horrible, but there are some people, guys, they are going through things because they have been habitually disobedient to the Lord, and things are falling down on them, and they want you to pray for them, and, you know, no matter how much you're praying for them, and no matter how much you're ministering to them, they are still not being, nothing is happening, and understandably, things doesn't happen right away, but you, you're going to be be able to discern the difference because I understand there are times that we're just going to go through our trials, but there's something else with it. You know, you can be going through your trial, but you know God is with you, but there's a difference between a tormented soul that's before you that your prayers are not working, your intercession for them is not working, and they're getting worse and worse. You have to just, guys, just, you have to use discernment. Because sometimes there are people that's going through things because when God was giving them peace, when God was giving them mercy, when God was calling out to them, they continued on their own way. In verse 13, it says, rising up early and speaking, God is saying he was speaking to them. And now because you have done all these works that the Lord and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. So sometimes people, they get into the habit. These individuals, the Lord was warning them and warning them and giving them grace and grace and grace. And things begin to happen. 
It comes a time that they're calling him and he is not hearing them. And that's why Jeremiah 55 that says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Because there's a time when he will not hear you. I'm sorry, Isaiah, Isaiah 55 and 6. So let's look at that really quick. Let me go over there. Isaiah 55 and 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I'm going to take you to another scripture. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 and 20 says, Behold, I stand, the, the, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So there are opportunities that God gives us over and over again before there's that Jeremiah 7 experience where now God is, the judgment of God is coming and no one is able to save and he's not going to hear. There's an opportunity and there's always copious amounts of grace and mercy and forgiveness and long suffering that the Lord has towards us because he loves us. Let's go look at Matthew chapter five. Let's go to Matthew five, guys. And we're going to read verse 29. This is God's position on sin for those people that will say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Here's Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 5 and 29. And if thy right hand and if thy right eye offend you, pluck it out. Let's go up to 28. 27. You have heard it. You heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if that right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that thy whole body should perish in hell. The Lord talks about sin so many times. The danger of it. And he's saying, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He's telling you, if you look at someone to lust after them. You know, the old days it says you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't do the act, do the act. But here in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus raises the standard and the ante and says, if you look at the person, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So the Lord is talking about sins of the heart. He's addressing and he's saying, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it away from you. Now he's not telling you to literally gouge out your eyes, but he, Think about it. He's giving you an example of how serious this is, how desperate we should be about removing ourselves from darkness. And what is he saying? Pluck it out. That means you recognize it, remove it, take it out and cast it, separate yourself from it because it's better for you to be with one eye for that one eye to perish than for your whole body to perish in hell. If your right hand causes you, causes you to sin, cut it off. Because sin is an offense to God. Cut your hand off. Think of how painful that is. Think of how inconvenient that is. Think of how incomplete you will feel without it. But God wants us through, that's what he's teaching us through Jesus Christ, that we must be completely reviled when it comes to sin. And even if it's to our own discomfort and it may not feel right to be without this person or may not feel right when you're trying to not it doesn't feel right to not be smoking and partying and doing the things that you used to do. It's better that that part of you perish because it will perish if you're willing to pluck it out, recognize it, and cast it from you. It will perish. It's better for you to be without that 
than that your entire body perish in hell. That's the Lord's position on sin. And if we go to Matthew chapter 22, is it Matthew 22? Hold on, guys. So let's go to Matthew 22. Here's another, another parable that Jesus gives. Starting at 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain man, a certain king, which made a marriage for his son and set, sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. So these people were the ones that were given the promise to come, come and feast. And they were invited to the wedding, but they would not come again so another time again he's given them mercy again he sent forth other servants saying tell them which are bidden behold i have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage that's the lord calling those who say that they are saved and those who say that they're of god and they want to know god and he's calling out there he's saying come but they made light of it and went their ways one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully. The remnant of God. Those who are supposed to, that those who claim to be the remnant and those who claim to be of God took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. They don't want to hear. They're mistreating them. Stop calling us and telling us we have to stop sinning. Stop telling us that we have to turn to God. Stop telling us that we need to sit and feast at his table and not at this world's table or at the table of my own desires. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He was upset and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Therefore said he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out onto the highways and gathered together all as many as would as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither? not having a wedding garment, and he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in 14, it says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. You see, if we go back to Jeremiah chapter seven, there is an entitled spirit that sometimes believers can have. God can't do this to me. God's not supposed to do that to me. I'm his child. I'm the one that he called. I'm in this position. But the Lord is looking at the constant disobedience. Disobedience. There are people that's calling themselves friends of God and they're not. You see here in Matthew 22 and 18, Matthew 22 and verse 12 in the same parable the king said and he said unto him this is the person the person that did not have on the wedding garments the king went over to him and said friend how camest thou hitherto how did you come in here not having on the wedding garment and he was speechless because there are people who think they're going to be able to slip into heaven on a banana peel still enter into the kingdom of god without having going through the process of changing and transforming from the old worldly clothes to the conforming outfits to the wedding garments there are people that think they can crash the wedding and they're not going to be able to and he says friend how did you get in here without wedding garments and he had nothing to say. And then he was thrown out. Now let me show you something in Matthew 26 and 50. When Judas came, Judas in 49, and forthwith he came, and forthwith he came to Jesus. This is this is Judas. Okay? Let's go up to 48. This is what Judas says. Now he that betrayed him, Judas, gave them a sign, saying, Whoever I shall kiss, that man is he. Hold him fast. And he went forth and said to Jesus, Hail, Master, and kissed him. 
And what does Jesus say in verse 50? And Jesus said to him, friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came, laid hands on him and took him. You notice that? Friend. Again, where did you come from? Where did you come from? Just as he said here, the king said, friend, where did you come from? Isn't that interesting? There are individuals that believe that they can just enter in and do what they want to do and live how they want to live and still enter into the kingdom of God and still call themselves friends. That's how they can, that's what they call themselves. You say you're a friend, but you're about to enter into outer darkness because here's what's missing. You don't have on any wedding garments. Friend, okay, where are you coming from? I know your heart, Judas. You're about to betray me. But what was the end of Judas? He became tormented by his own sin and he ended up hanging himself. I'm going to read you something in John chapter... 14 okay John chapter 14 it tells us hold on John 14 and 21 says he that has my commandments this is Jesus saying he that has my commandments and keeps them he it is that loves me and he that loves me shall be loved of my father and I will show and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him he that has my commandments, that means you know the word of God, you know the commandments of God. And not only, guys, the Ten Commandments and, and what's in the Bible, but also the commandments that God gives to us in our everyday lives, in our everyday situation. When he gives you the commandment of you should not be speaking to that person that way, you handle that situation wrong. Don't gossip, don't lie, don't steal, don't go to this Netflix and chilling session. Do not commit adultery. Do not move in with this man. Do not allow this woman to move in with you. Do not uh, falsely accuse those commandments. If you keep them, it's not just about hearing and knowing the word of God, but it's about also keeping them. It is he that loves me and he that loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will manifest myself unto him. And further on, it says, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. Do you notice that? Not only the commandments of God and the Bible, but his words, what he speaks to you. And my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And verse 24 says, he that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father which sent me. God is saying, Jesus is saying, this is not even my own words that I'm saying, but my father. It's, there's no in between. There's no, I kind of love you or, you know, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. If you hear, if you hear his commandments and you keep them, it is, you're the one, this is truly a sign that we love him. If you love the Lord, you're going to obey him. And I'm going to show you this in Matthew, I'm sorry, in John chapter 15 and 14, Jesus goes on to say, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. You are my friend if you do what I command you. They are friends that want to enter the wedding banquet free, okay? Meaning they don't want to sacrifice anything. The, the feast has already been prepared. All you have to do is come. All you have to do is answer the call. But there are many of God's children, those who are saying and professing to be believers, they're serving God their way. They're doing what they want to do and they feel entitled. But then God is going around these individuals and saying, okay, you don't want to serve me. I'm going out into the highways. I'm sending my angels out into the highways and the byway. And I'm going to I am going to call out to those who you would never thought would be called. That's why now that you're seeing people come in, the person with the full tattoos on their face and on their knuckles, the person that's done the worst things, 
He's calling people out of the prison cells, literal prison cells. He's calling those who have been witches and warlocks. He's calling all of them because in the core of all these individuals that the worst sinner that you can think of, sometimes you will find there is a need for God. They have a loyalty. They have a tenacity They because they know where they came from, where God brought them from. And in the core of all of them, even though they were sinning hard, they had a loyalty and they had a tenacity and they had a true desire for God that was there, but it was perverted and turned to darkness. So when he calls them out, he knows with all their tattoos on their face and body and their piercing and their lips and in their eyes and in their face, they are going to serve him wholeheartedly. They are going to allow him to do the perfect work. The person who sat there under all those tattoo needles, handling all the pain of all that stuff for their tattoos, they can still and fasten all the pain of rejections and the cutting and the carvings of the world rejecting them and whoever's going to laugh at them. The gangbanger that was quick to run and, and, and kill somebody and beat somebody down for his gang member, his fellow gang member, and for what they believed in is the same one that will stand boldly before anybody who will try to come against him or her for God because, because they serve the Lord. There's an entitlement, an entitled spirit. People forget that they were, they, they're forgetting where they came from. And they're thinking, okay, God, you do this. You give me, give me, give me. You need to do, you need to do, you need to give me. You're supposed to. And so they're taking certain things for granted. God's my buddy. That's my guy. That's my dude. Really? But only those who not only hears, but that obeys his commandments, it is he. This is this, this person is the one who truly loves him and he will manifest himself unto them. There's some people, they're not experiencing anything with the Lord. They don't have that revelation because they're sinning. They're living in sin. And the worst sins are those subtle ones. Well, let's not say worse because there's not one sin that's, that's greater than the other but what i'm saying is when i say worse is because they would just it's there you can't these individuals they sin on the inside they look normal but inside they're wicked 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 in their hearts there's those outward sins that's obvious but then there's this other population and it's something that's in a lot of people that say that they're christians they have a wickedness in them a prideful behavior a subtle nastiness that's there. This is not all of them, but a lot. There are people, lots and lots of people who profess to be Christians that's going to be falling into hell by groves because they will not yield and allow the Lord to deal with their heart. And they think that all their religious movements and antics and sacrifices are enough. But the Lord is saying, can you be committing adultery? Meaning you can be committing adultery, not only physically, but in your heart. Murdering, not only physically, but murdering souls in your heart through your to through words and by doing there's a lot of people that get murdered in church on a regular basis because they go in there and they're mistreated and they're being told false doctrine and lies and they're being rejected and they're being kicked out and they're being they don't want them or they bring them in and they turn them into a, a greater child of hell than themselves as the lord told the pharisees and the scribes but let's go to revelation chapter 22 and go to verse 11. The word of God says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The angel of the Lord is saying, Okay, after you've spoken the word, John, you've given them this word. And you, you all continue profess, you are professing the word of God and they're refusing it and they're just rejecting it and they're continuing to kill and mock the saints and mock God and curse God. The bottom line is God's not pressed. God has given us every opportunity. Here's what he says. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Okay. You keep doing what you're going to do. Even after you heard this word. Okay. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, this is the word of the Lord. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. 
every man, not some. He's going to give every man according to what they've done. So those people that want to tell you it's not about works. God is coming to judge your works. Don't allow freeloading Christians, people who want to be freeloaders and they just want to come and eat for free. It'll be those people like if you tell them that you, they can stay at your house and they come and eat you out of house and home because you said I have to live here. You, you allow them to drive your car and they'll drive your car and destroy it. And you never said I should put gas in. Those are what you call freeloaders, people that who are wicked in their hearts. And so they're going to go and take advantage of God. It, it does, it's not hitting them. They'll talk about, well, he, you sacrificed on the cross so I can sin. This is a wicked and selfish person. Why would you want to continue to sin against God? Why would you not want to learn and allow the Holy Spirit to do what you cannot possibly do in your flesh? But these individuals are like dark vortexes. They want and want. Yeah, you died on the cross. Yeah, they pierced you in your side. Thank you. But you know what? You said I can be saved and without nothing. I don't have to sacrifice anything. The Bible doesn't say that. The word of God says we're supposed to be an example. But what does it say here? What does it say? And behold, I come quickly and I will give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life. You hear that? Blessed are they that do, not hear or kind of. Blessed are they that do his commandments and that they may have right to the tree of life. If you're not obeying God, individuals that don't obey him, they don't have any rights to God and to his blessings. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the, through the gates into the city. For without, that means outside the gates, are dogs, not pets. It is a term that the Lord uses, like when he's speaking about people who are ravenous wolves, evil folks. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and maketh a lie, they're outside the gates. Now, sometimes people want to think, oh, well, I'm not a sorcerer. I'm not a whoremonger. I'm not a murderer. Guys, it's physically, and then there are things that people do spiritually. There are people who murder people all the time with their mouth, with their actions, by setting people up, by setting people against them, destroying them in spirit. Idolaters, anything you put before God is idolatry. Anything that you put before the Lord, people will think idolatry is just people who actually have statues of different gods. No, you could be idol you can commit idolatry in your heart. Whosoever loves, that means you love listening to mess and make lies, are liars. The Bible talks a lot about liars. It says the liars shall have their tongue cut out. The Lord hates liars. And in Proverbs chapter 7, we get, uh, the Lord also talks a bit in Proverbs 7 about the seven things that he hates. And those seven things ironically covers about every, any possible thing that you can do. Any possible sin. Is it Proverbs 7? Let's see. Let me look. It's Proverbs chapter 6. There's seven things that the Lord hates. He hates a proud look. He hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. Not only physically, guys, but people that attack and destroy people who are innocent just because they can a heart that devises wicked imaginations. He hates feet that are swift in running to mischief. He hates a false witness that speaks lies. And he hates a person that sows discord among brethren. Doesn't that cover everything? 
He hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, just thinking about evil things, feet that are swift and running to mischief. Mischief is whatever thing that's against God that he does not like. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. No, sowing discord among brethren is not telling people that they need to turn to the Lord and do what is right. That's not sowing discord. Sowing discord is willfully causing division between people. Stirring the pot. Lots of pastors do that all the time. Not all, but a lot of them do, with the exception of a few that truly love God. They sow discord among brethren on huge in on on huge uh levels or whatever that word is I'm looking for on a huge scale because they can turn a bunch of people against one another in the church and and against a person they've been given that that position and then people can so cause discord among brethren right in your house you're treating your children differently Elevating one over another, doting over one child and not the other. You see, a lot of times people are not forgetting are forgetting about that audience of souls that's in your home. Your children are souls. And sometimes people, parents are doing that. The youngest can say and do whatever they want to do, or there's one that they favor. They're more athletic. They're comparing them. So what happens? The children begin to have resentment towards the younger or the older. The younger begins to feel that they can disrespect the older. And then there's one that feels very inferior because the parents keep doting on one and comparing. How come you didn't fill out like her? How come you're not tall like your brother? How come you're not athletic like your sister? How come you're not as smart as this person? And and that's sowing discord as well, guys. I'm just bringing it home. Sowing discord. Allowing your family to attack your wife or your husband. Sowing discord. Talking to that man or that woman who's in a marriage. or And, and you are on the outside as a friend that's saying things that's causing him not to be able to be with his wife the way that he should, sh causing her not to be able to connect and be with her husband like she should because you are on the outside meddling in their marriage, meddling in their relationship. A man or a woman, they're together. You're a married woman giving advice to a man in his relationship with his girlfriend or someone who he's considering for marriage you're in your marriage meddling into the mind of a woman on what she needs to do with the man that she is dating or she is going to marry that's sowing discord it's your brother and your sister in the lord and then just causing a hot mess up in the church sowing discord because you're sinning as a pastor sinning and doing evil and then what's happening if people call you out on it when other members of the church speak on it what you do is you're playing you're causing to want to choose sides so you sow discord among those who are speaking the word of god in truth the lord hates that so what does it boil down to? Let's go back over to Jeremiah 7. There's a lot of individuals who feel entitled. That will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house? That's what a lot of people are doing. Let's go down to verse 18. The children gather wood and the father kindle the fires and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. You see, people are following after other gods. Whatever sin you may be doing, you don't know what God, what demon that's tied to, but know this, when you do things that's outside of the will of God and you continue to do it, you may not be physically baking a cake, but spiritually you are. You're saying, I am in covenant and I'm in agreement and I submit to you lust. I submit to you lying. I submit to you anger. I submit to you unforgiveness. I submit to you racism. I submit to you sexism. I submit to you indifference. I submit to you fear. God is calling for repentance. The wages of sin is death. 
It does not matter how much you claim to be a Christian if you are sitting and you are in and out and you've got your hand halfway in and, and you, your hands are in but your feet are out. You're going to hear depart from me. There are lots and lots of believers, people who say that they're Christian, that's not going to go to heaven. And the person, the thief and the gang member and the person who's struggling and the person that that's have a bunch of that's killed a bunch of people that turned to the Lord with a whole heart that's been in the prisons and did their time and did their sentence. And now they turn to Jesus Christ. That person will be in before you. There are many Christians and believers, they'd be sitting here and they're doing all this stuff and they'd be surprised to look up and see Tupac going into heaven and they going in the other direction. I'm just giving you an example. Don't come chase me down like, oh, you said that. But I'm giving you an example of the irony. I'm just giving you an example of the irony of it. You know, everybody know Tupac, the rap artist that got killed back in the 90s, I believe, Okay. Tupac was cussing and doing all types of stuff. I'm giving an example. How, how how crazy would that be? The person who feels that I've been serving the Lord all my life. And then they look and see Tupac entering into heaven. And they're here and depart from me. I'm telling you the, ir the irony of how things are going to be. I'm giving you an example. I am not saying Tupac is in heaven. I am not saying Tupac is in hell. I don't know where his soul is. Only the Lord knows. But I'm giving you an example of that. How crazy would it be a person who feels like they're entering to heaven and then they see Charles Manson going in and they're not? I'm giving you an example of the ironic surprises that's going to be in the end. We know good and well that if someone has sinned, if Charles Manson died in his sins and he died in his sins, I can't say where he is. Okay, I don't like to say where people are because I don't have that judgment. But if he died still not believing in the Lord then he is, or, or, or never accepting Jesus, then... Yeah, but I'm giving you those things as examples of how it's going to be. You, the people that you're thinking that's going to just be entering in, they are not. And I remember there were two very profound pastors that died. And, you know, I never even followed them. I've heard of them before. One, I had listened to him, listened to his teachings and stuff. And then another one, I heard of him, always heard of him because he was so high profile. Well, both these very well-known pastors died. And um, I remember that just, it wasn't even around the time that they died, but sometime after that, it may have been years later on, I had a dream and I saw the both of them, these two pastors standing in front of me. And they look normal. They look like themselves. But inside, I could feel in my body, I felt all these lustful feelings. It was disgusting. Because number one, ew, not trying to be funny, but I would never look at them like that. Never. Because, ew, okay, I'm not, oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But just yuck, okay? I would never look at them that way. Um the respect factor and just no so i'm feeling all these feelings in my body lustful feelings you know specifically just ew i just lust like a strong lusty feeling you know i hate to really get into it but you know how i don't want to get into it but it was just a strong lusting feeling Okay, Lord, I'll see. You know how it feels like, say, those of you that's had intercourse before, how you feel right before you're getting ready to have an orgasm or something like that? It was just like the swelling, gross feeling that I'm like, ew, but they're standing in front of me and they didn't say anything, but I felt this feeling the entire time. And I woke up and I was just so disgusted. I was like, oh, I want to take a shower. I want to take a shower. Oh. And... I asked the Lord, I'm like, the Lord, what was that? And the Lord said, these two preachers struggled with lust. They struggled with lust. The way, you know, like I felt how it was just so strong. They struggled with that. And I believe that the Lord showed me that. I had no reason for it. I, I had no, I didn't just watch something about them. He showed me these two people believe that they are 
resting and that they're in heaven, but they are not. Said so they're not. They struggled with lust. Struggle with it in their minds and in their hearts. And there's some there they he was just saying, and some even carried out the act. And they have perished and they did not make it into heaven. Because they secretly struggled and they did not turn to me because they looked at all the work and everything everything that they were doing and how they were applauded and how the people held them up. They felt like they were so needed that they didn't have time to repent or they're so good, they're looking at themselves and saying, I'm doing so much good, God is not going to do anything. God, God wouldn't do this to me. I'm good. But the Lord revealed to me that these two men never, these two well-known pastors that have passed away are not in eternal life. And I was really heartbroken. Especially one of them. I was like, there's no way I would even believe that this person, and I'll never say who, I'll never say who, but it saddened me. So what I'm saying is, is it's important that we're serving the Lord wholeheartedly. It's important that we repent of our sins. It's important that we're always allowing the Lord to deal with our hearts, that we turn to him. It is important that you do not, as believers, get to a place that you become so entitled that you think you can do whatever you want to do and still enter into the house of God. And what happens is in Romans 1, if you read it, a person that constantly sins before the Lord and does wrong and evil, they'll become entitled in their sins. They'll begin to just get foolish and darken in their minds. And guys, that is why it's something that the Lord revealed to me. When you get around people or you listen and you hear pastors that sit on their platforms or they're sitting on there with 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 the news and and people from the news and on talk shows and things and you notice they're always asking these pastors profound questions they ask them outright questions whether it's about certain lifestyles or about sin or who jesus is they when they start to scramble and give that oh, i don't know i don't know and not only that the lord is saying when you're talking to people and you're showing them the word of god what it says about sin or what it says about certain things and they're just going against it no matter what the word of God says people that just tell you yeah I can sit and go to heaven and then you see them look for scripture and find that scripture that doesn't say that and then they just they begin to just flourish on that and make up their own stuff and they ignore the rest of the bible that talks about sin you're looking at someone who's reprobate you're looking at someone that is reprobate they're lost when you look at that stuff be very afraid, not of them, but that's what sin does. It takes you to this place that suddenly they will be stirring the pot. They're so desperate to sin that they're going to look into the word and find something and says, yes, the word says this, but the interpretation that they have to make sin okay comes from the wicked heart that's within. The darkness of their heart will find interpretation in the word of God while ignoring the rest that says you cannot. That is the danger of sin, guys. And what happened with these two pastors that were well-known and they just passed and the Lord revealed to me that they did not make it in, it was very scary to me because one of them, like I said, you know, I've read a lot of this person's books and things and, and I'm like, Lord, what about these books? Yes, this person's done the work. This person's brought this here. Those things, those books and those things were going to be published no matter what, whether by him or not, it was going to happen. But this person's heart, they harbored lust and they did not deal with it. They did not allow me to deal with it because they were too busy, quote unquote, serving me. And now they've lost eternal life. A lot of people will say, why would God just put you in hell for this one thing? Because that one thing, the Holy Spirit could have helped you. The problem is people will reject God. The problem is not only the sin, but most importantly, that you allow that sin to separate you from God because you did not want, you did not, you rejected the Holy Spirit for your sin. And if you think about the years and the years, if you know there's something that you're doing right now, you think of that thing that you're doing right now. Think of how many years, how many hours of your life you spent doing that. Think about that. 
And think about those of you that you've been delivered and God brought you out. Look at all the years and the hours that you have been sinning and doing what you want to do. So if someone dies in their sin and they lose eternal life, it's not going to be something that, oh, it's just this one thing. That one thing, the Holy Spirit, is that one thing you were not willing to give up for the Lord. And God looks at sin as sin. You're not going to drink out of a cup that has just a tiny drop of poison and mostly juice, a tiny bit of arsenic and mostly water. And that, that thing in you, you wouldn't do it unless you were just someone that was in a country where you have no water and you're so thirsty. But normally you would not. You're not going to eat any food that just had just a tiny bit of bug in it. That's most people with the exception of those who are just starving to death. Okay, but most individuals, those individuals, if they weren't starving, they wouldn't eat that. So I'm here to speak to you and tell you it's best to turn to the Lord right now while he was giving you an opportunity, while he's inviting you to the wedding feast, answer his call. While he's knocking at the door, answer. While he's calling out to you, answer. While he may be found, answer. Because there's going to come a time that because of sin, you'll be separated from the Lord. There's going to come a time where no amount of prayer or intercession or crying out to the Lord will be heard by him because his judgment is going to come. Please turn around, repent, do not have an emotional moment, repent, ask the Lord to help you become completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. This is through daily conversation with God. That's what prayer is having a real conversation with him, asking him to help you, being honest about your sins and what you are struggling with, and asking the Lord to help you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though you may not have the evidence of tongues, it does not mean the Holy Spirit is still not there. He is there to guide you and to lead you into all truth. And you can pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit, in, and in time you will receive that, if that is what he will do. But believe me, you can't get the infilling of the Holy Spirit if you don't listen when the Holy Spirit tells you not to do certain things. Sin is serious. The wages of sin brings death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Choose you this day who you will serve. Deuteronomy 30 and 19 says, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you this day. I have set blessings and cursing, death or life. Choose life that it may be good for you and your descendants. What will you choose?